Imagine you're out for a hike, feeling the rush of a good exercise with fresh air all around you, and then you're hit with the sight and smell of a person who has been gone for days. This is what happened in Queens, New York to a young girl not too long ago, and it could happen to you. You're watching Darkness Prevails, the best channel to share your creepy stories with the world, because this world is a strange one. Hey everyone, we've hit 300,000 subs, and I can honestly say I didn't think I'd make it this far. I just want to let you know that I appreciate every one of you. From the folks that tune in for my videos to those who donate and buy merchandise, all of you hold a special place in my heart. You've allowed me to reach my dreams and nightmares, of course, and I'm honored to know and entertain you all. I've never been Darkness Prevails, but together, we 300,000 scary story lovers from around the world, we are Darkness Prevails, an online campfire where everyone and anyone has the right to share their story. So again, thank you. Now, uh, let's get into those stories. That's why you're here, after all. Number one, what we encountered in those woods. Submitted by Chris B. I lived in Tennessee, and I was a big fan of camping and hiking. In 2006, me, my girlfriend, and my cousin, with four other friends, had gone out on a hiking trip. My girlfriend's uncle had a rather large property he sometimes allowed people to stay at. In one remote corner of this land, he even had an old cabin that he would rent out occasionally, and this property was connected to a no man's land, as some people called it. You could go out there, as some of us had before, but you wouldn't see any other signs of people at all. We intended to rough it along the back trails with the intention to camp overnight. After a long hike, it got dark, so we built a fire and set up our small tents. Then we had a couple of beers, cooked a few hot dogs over the flames. It was pleasantly uneventful until near midnight. We had been telling stories when suddenly, my cousin started looking off into the dark and began to try to hush us. Shh, guys. After a few moments of quiet, I tried to ask what was happening when he bluntly told me to hush up. I heard something like voices out there, I think. We all stayed quiet for the next minute or two. My cousin swearing he had heard voices Voices calling out there past the tree line in the distance. Soon, we began catching what sounded like the faintest yelling that we couldn't quite make out, and a few of us began yelling back to whoever it was out there in the dark, trying to get a response of any kind. We thought that maybe someone was lost. In these woods, it wouldn't be hard. Hello, is someone out there? Are you okay? My girlfriend yelled, joined in by one of my friends, shouting through his cupped hands, Hello! All we heard in reply was what sounded like muffled voices, two voices, as if they were calling from a great distance, but it sounded like there was somebody moving around just on the far side of the nearby tree line, and they couldn't have been greater than a 100 yards away. More echoing shouts came from that area, but they were still indiscernible. It sounded like two people shouting at the same time. Increasingly, I became nervous, wondering who was moving around out there, imagining backwoods creeps playing games with their victims. Here at midnight, something was wrong, I felt. For a short while, we heard nothing, one of my friends went to his gear and retrieved the old Ruger Bearcat 22 that his father gave him as a gift. If someone wants to rush our camp, I'd like for us to be ready, he said. I nodded, feeling on edge. Do you need help? My cousin shouted again. In response came two voices shouting vaguely once more, still sounding distant. Before, they had sounded like someone shouting words even if we couldn't quite make it out. 
but now the shouts were loud and garbled, wordless shouts and baying noises. Someone was moving around out there. My girlfriend said what I was thinking quietly. Who are these people? Why are they here and why are they messing around somebody's camp right now? For the next half hour, there was silence besides the fire and the nightlife. We sat on guard around the fire, straining to listen. During that stretch, we heard no more shouting or footfalls. We resolved to keep the 22 around, just in case someone came barging into our camp. Several minutes later, we heard what sounded like people moving about only a short distance past the light cast by our fire. Footfalls and the crackle of branches and leaves. It sounded like someone was staggering around at a brisk speed, just out of our campsite. A couple of us expected someone to step into the light at any moment, but no one did. Suddenly, it stopped. Not another voice was heard, no footfalls, no crunching of grass or branches, nothing to indicate that the people or things that were by our camp were still there, or had even gone away for that matter. It was more like they had just started standing still. All of us were extremely nervous, especially with how the sounds of footsteps had just stopped instead of moving away. We were sure somebody was just watching us from a ways off and waiting for us to fall asleep. We managed to organize ourselves to sleep in shifts, at least two people to stay awake at all times while the others slept in our tents. It wasn't easy, especially with an odd-numbered group, but the rest of the night passed without incident, thankfully. In the morning, we nervously gathered our gear and decided to leave, the appeal of being out in the woods having vanished in the night. What disturbed me was how far off the voices had sounded yet how closely the movements had come to us and how they had disappeared so suddenly. I was certain that this was not just some people deciding to prank campers or any sneaking backwoodsmen having a good laugh. This was something else entirely. Number two, M, submitted by Mr. Snores. It happened about two years ago. My friends, Pete and Joe, were spending the week at my house. It was summer vacation, after all. We lived in a small town to the west of Tennessee. There were plenty of fields around where I lived, so we usually went out on hikes. It was getting late one evening. We had just finished watching some scary movies and were having trouble sleeping, of course, that's when Joe had the bright idea of going to a nearby field for a bit of a midnight hike. I told him we weren't allowed to go hiking at night, but he didn't care. Pete wasn't so sure at first, but after he was convinced, the two of them convinced me, and sure enough, we started to sneak out. Luckily, my parents were fast asleep, so that part was easy. Now, we had never been in this field at night, we were aware of coyotes and such, so I had brought my machete just in case. As soon as we entered the field, we immediately got the feeling that we were being watched. We tried to ignore it, because to me, it was probably the fact that we were out where we shouldn't be, when we shouldn't be. Around 20 minutes later, we decided to stop for a break. Pete and Joe decided to sit down for a little bit, but I couldn't. I got that same feeling again, as if we were being watched or even worse, hunted. I decided to go over to a nearby hill so I could look out over the fields. It wasn't too dark due to the fact that it was a full moon and we were in a large open field. At the time, this field was growing wheat and the wheat grew to about my waist. So anything I spotted, it could easily slip away into the wheat grass or not be shown at all because it hid underneath it. At first, to my relief, I didn't see anything, but after a few moments, I spotted movement, and then I saw them, these bright yellow eyes, 
They were about 100 yards away. I nearly jumped when I saw them. Remember what I said about the wheatgrass being to my waist? Well, I was about 5'7 at the time, and these eyes were easily four feet above the wheatgrass. Whatever it was, it was tall, taller than me, and I was so scared that I couldn't move. Shortly thereafter, Pete and Joe came up to the hill to see what I was doing. One look at my face, and they knew something was wrong, horribly wrong. Joe asked me, Dude, what's up? But I couldn't speak, barely breathe. All I could do was point at those awful yellow eyes. After a few seconds of looking, they both saw what I was staring at, and we all just stood there motionless. When, all of a sudden, the eyes disappeared into the wheat grass, as if the creature was now crawling. Immediately, we turned and ran. We ran so fast, it all seemed like a blur. We didn't even know if this thing was coming towards us, but we were not waiting around to find out. When we finally got to the end of my road, we all stopped to catch our breaths, assuming we were safe but we were wrong. That's when we heard the loudest, deepest, hair-raising howl I'd ever heard. Then we heard panting and loud footsteps, as if something the size of a bear was running towards us. Again, we turned and ran down the street until we were next to my house. Then we did something stupid. We looked back and what we saw still haunts me to this day. It was terrifyingly close to us. I could see it perfectly. It had stopped under a street light about 50 yards away, but it was standing on two legs. It had a muscular torso like a person, but the legs were bent and shaped like a dog's legs. Its arms were long, as were its legs, and it had the head of a wolf or a bear, it was covered in black fur and it stood there watching us. We couldn't take it anymore. We ran inside. We locked all the doors, the windows, but before we could feel safe again, there was one last window that we had to lock upstairs. But because of the positioning of the window, I was too scared to go up. That window had a perfect view of the creature, which meant it had a perfect view of me. Eventually, I built up the courage to go to the window. While I was locking it, I couldn't help but look down at the street, and there it was still, and just like I had feared, it was looking up at me. I locked it as quickly as I could and ran back to tell Joe and Pete. Then we all ran upstairs to watch it, but it was gone by the time I got back. We didn't sleep that night. The next day, we felt it was best to tell my parents the story, but the only part of the story they wanted to hear was the part where we snuck out at night. Pete and Joe went home and I was grounded. Anyone else we told wouldn't believe us, but I think we know what we saw, and I will never go to that field at night again. Like I said, it's been two years and I finally convinced myself to go back to the field for hikes during the day. But every now and then, I get that same feeling, like something is watching me. Number three, The Thing in DeBerry Swamp, submitted by Alpha64. I'm 15 years old and live in a remote part of Florida. A couple of years ago, I was really into hiking and going into the woods with friends. To start this off, me and my friend Liam were out together hiking in the woods. We would always go on the weekends just to wind down and relax or to have some airsoft wars in the drier parts of the woods. After one long day of fishing, we were unpacking our gear as the sun was beginning to set. When Liam noticed something strange with the tackle box we had brought along with us, hey Blake, he said, dude, come check this out. I came over to him, a little annoyed as I was still setting up my tent, 
and it was a pain in the butt to pitch. What is it? I stopped, as I now saw the long scratch marks that were engraved in the top and side of the now mangled tackle box. What in the world did that? I asked, still examining the scratch marks. I couldn't seem to figure out what kind of animal had tried to get into his box. I don't know, he replied, but it was like this when we had come back to set up the tent. I was now a little on edge, thinking, great, there's probably a bear in the area. Keep your knife close by you when you sleep tonight, I said, clutching my pocket knife I had brought along. We made our fire and began talking. After a little while, the thoughts of earlier had drifted to the back of our minds until we both heard what sounded like footsteps of some sort of animal coming from the underbrush. We both looked over at the source of the noise, thinking about what it could be. Those footsteps were too loud to be anything like a raccoon or a squirrel, so we had our knives out just in case it was a predator stalking us. But what emerged from the underbrush has permanently scarred my mind. It was a tall, thin, and pale-looking creature, almost pathetic-looking in how scrawny it was, but its hands were claws that were bigger than any I'd seen attached to an animal. I don't think it even had eyes, only dark pits of where the eyes should have been, but I knew it was still somehow staring at us. It then made this ear-piercing shriek, lowered down on all fours, and began to charge at us. By then, I couldn't keep myself from shrieking this unmanly sound from my mouth, and I did the only thing I could think to do, and I kicked the tackle box at it in a quick attempt to distract or hurt it. As soon as the box hit the creature, Liam and I made a mad dash toward the bathroom building that was inside the nearby camping area. Once we made it, we locked ourselves inside, we didn't get an ounce of sleep that night, still hearing the wild pattering circling the building, and occasionally hearing the creatures shrieking and clawing at the outside walls of the little building we were in. I was afraid that it was going to come through the door at any moment. We had stopped hearing the shrieking at one point, and the pattering died down, but we still waited to go outside until the sun rose, just in case it was waiting for us. When we finally did emerge from our temporary safe haven, we saw claw marks all over the door and walls of the little building. We quickly made our way back to the camp, keeping out a close eye on our surroundings. When we made it back, everything was destroyed and thrown all over the place. We turned around and got out of there as quickly as possible, not picking up our stuff, not wanting that thing to come back to us. When we got back to Liam's place, we decided not to go back out there and to not tell anyone what we saw, because despite what we just lived through, the sound of the story made it seem insane. Number four, The Creepy Man, submitted by Clara. When I was 16 years old, I lived in Michigan. I am a huge athletic nerd and I go hiking every day, unless I feel lazy. On a particular day, I picked the wrong day to go because I met someone and experienced something I will not want to experience ever again. So one day I drove to my favorite hiking trail. It's the one I go to just about every time I go hiking. And right away, I saw this weird guy. He looked to be in his mid-30s, but me being as stubborn and hard-headed as I was, I ignored my gut instinct, which was telling me to just go home today. So I parked, got out, and went on the jogging trail. Before I disappeared on the trail, though, I got a short glance at the guy. He was looking back at me, too. So I looked away and went off. I got 200 to 300 yards away from the entrance, and I took a short break. And that's around the time I heard this scream. It sounded like it was from a man. I looked down the path to see if someone needed help, but my heart sank in my chest. 
It was the guy from the start of the trail. He was running straight toward me. My adrenaline pumped and I began to run away from him as fast as possible. But he was catching up to me quickly and I thought I was pretty fast. The guy ran like he had taken two shots of steroids or something. When I realized him catching up to me was inevitable, I began to cry and panic. I took a sharp turn straight into the woods and I started to run back toward the parking lot area. But I never stopped hearing those footsteps not too far behind me. Soon though, as I kept running, the footsteps behind me were growing faint. They were going slower than before and I was getting closer and closer to the parking lot, to my escape. At last, I broke through the tree line and I ran for my car. Once there, I locked the doors, I took out my cell phone, and I called the cops. Not so long after they arrived, they searched for the man and found him. Apparently, he was a 37-year-old homeless man, and better yet, he was carrying around a butcher knife in one of his coat pockets, something he had found behind a restaurant in a dumpster. So, what was he going to do with that, I wonder? To this day, I am still glad I did ROTC throughout high school, or else I'm sure he would have caught up to me, or I would have run out of energy faster. Creepy maniac homeless man, please stay away from me. And number five, my experience, submitted by Vincent. I tell this story not as a call for attention, but as a cautionary tale. I was 14 and in a scout troop. Our scout troop was relatively small. We were camping in an area adjacent to a large hill. It wasn't tall enough to be considered a mountain, but if you fell, you would probably break a few things. And it was super steep. This is necessary for the story. After we had pitched our tents, it was dark. It was only about 10 p.m., so we had some time to ourselves. We all decided to climb the hill together. We were scouts, so hiking was our thing. The hill was quite steep though, so we had to bring a rope and tie it to the fence. After I made sure it wouldn't come undone, we began to ascend. We walked around and found a section of fence that appeared to have been trampled over. Behind that fence, there was an old circular concrete building. We began to walk around the thing and we soon found an entrance. There was a small box with a ladder that went up maybe about 20 feet or so. We all climbed the ladder and found a small steel door that gained us roof access and the roof was huge. Across the roof, there was a heavy steel trap door. We opened it and found at least a 25 foot drop. There was a ladder, however, so us being the brave scouts we thought we were, we began to climb in. The area inside was cavernous and massive, with concrete braces holding the ceiling up and a light blue tarp along the walls. It was incredibly dark down there, so visibility was extremely limited. Now, some people in my scout troop thought they were funny, so the two people standing guard on the roof closed the trap door. And I mean we were trapped. Then, as if something inside with us could tell that we were stuck, we began to hear a certain click, click, clicking. We all thought it was ambient noises or rocks falling from somewhere, so we tried to ignore it and went on. But moments later, one of the scouts shouted, Who is that? He knew nobody was there. Mike, what's going on? Someone else asked him. I felt someone breathing on my neck. Mike was now shouting. Knives drawn, we got close together. Somewhere else, we heard a laugh. Not that of someone laughing at a joke but a distant echo of a laughing, insane person. 
It echoed throughout the old building. Someone turned on their flashlight, and to our surprise, we saw a man. He appeared to be homeless. His face was old and worn, his hair untidy. He was only wearing an old, ripped and stained pair of jeans, and he looked as if he had not seen the sun in decades. He was an intimidating and deranged sight. The man himself only scared us a little bit. What really scared us was the knife he was holding. Keep in mind, we saw this man suddenly and over the course of a single second. Then he began screaming. Thank the heavens that the screaming they heard concerned the two people that were on the roof who had trapped us. They knew us, so they knew that we were not capable of such an ungodly noise. They opened the trap door and shouted, What was that? And with that, the man ran towards us. We all wildly ran toward the ladder and climbed up, with the first guy literally jumping on. I happened to be the one in the way back. I was climbing up the fifth rung when something grabbed a hold of my foot. Panicking, I swung down at him. What I didn't realize was that I was still holding my knife. It was thankfully closed, and I ended up merely bashing him across the skull with the grip. He screamed again and let go. Thankfully, this allowed us to fully escape. I climbed up the ladder, and as I resurfaced on the roof, I saw the man bleeding. He was now climbing the rusty ladder. Just then, the door closed, trapping him in there. Not wanting to take any chances, we ran back to the small door, taking us to the room with the ladder to the exit. Again, I was the last one there, and I blocked it off. I ended up tying the bar to one of the ladder's rungs, using an old bicycle tire that was nearby. I got onto the ladder myself, and I rushed down. I met back up with my fellow scouts over by the exit. We all silently decided to never speak of this moment. We'd probably get in a lot of trouble anyway. We got over to the trampled fence, and we made our way back down. We didn't go back up that hill again. To make sure nobody else got any bright ideas, I untied the rope, and I slid down the hill. The rest of the week was uneventful, but on the last night, I could have sworn I heard a distant screaming not that of a man in pain, but that of a man who had been driven into madness. Remember, if you do go urban exploring, bring something to defend yourself. If I hadn't had my knife in hand, I may not have been here to type this story. Hiking is probably my favorite way to get some exercise. You get to see the great outdoors, be a part of nature again, nearly get eaten alive and turned into a monster turd. Mm, that's the best part. Hiking can be scary too. The deeper you go into the woods, the more likely you may never return. So the next time you and your Fitbit go get your steps in, keep your eyes peeled for any weird nature around you because nature is always watching you. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to send me your creepy stories from the zoo at darknessprevails.org slash submit. If you want to support this channel even more, go on the Google Play Store and download Spooked, which is my app. Or you can donate one buck a month on my Patreon at patreon.com slash darknessprevails and get your name in the credits at the end of one of my videos. Or purchase some creepy cool Darkness Prevails merchandise at morbidmonsters.com. Now, here are my five favorite early comments from my previous video about five disturbing forest ranger cases. A Chicken Boy Gamer 06 says, Yogi Bear is going crazy. Oh yeah, we all knew Picnic Basket was just a metaphor for your bowels. Misfit says, I saw this video appear when watching another one of your videos. I love the ones about forests. Those are my favorite, 
as you can see, I'm finding any excuse to keep reading scary forest stories. Annie Hoglum says, I love you, Darkness. You have gotten me through some tough chores and horrible homework. Thanks so much. Hey, if you ever need some extra cash, I want someone to do my dishes full time. That crap sucks. Juliana Mees says, The scariest park ranger will always be Smokey Bear. What does he say again? Only you can prevent fire crotch? And Jesse Barr says, I love how you post so much so quickly. I never get bored anymore. This is my full-time job, and I'm here to please you guys. So the more the better. I never want to become one of those nasty once a month uploaders. Well, that brings us to the end of our stories today. I hope you really enjoyed. Here are the credits for the people who continue to donate on my Patreon. I love them so much. And as always, until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy.